Oh, just a note, Sachin, you're showing the uh, your speaker view. There we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, AI Mastery, Elevating Outcomes Through Data Quality and Governance, sponsored today by Precisely. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you can click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information yeah. requested throughout the webinar. Sorry. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, uh, Julie Skeen. And Julie is the moderator of this amazing panel that we've got lined up for you today. So Julie is a senior product marketing manager with Precisely. She has over 25 years of experience working on solutions um, for customer in data sensitive industries and data intensive industry. She focuses on understanding customer needs and ensuring precisely data quality and data observability yes, solutions are aligned with those thank needs. You, 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 you. And with that, I will yes, turn it over to Julie to get yourself. today's webinar started. Hello and introduce the panel. Hello and welcome. We've got some background noise too. I don't, I'm not sure what's, if we've got that, that sort of, okay. Awesome, Julie, hello and welcome. Hi Shannon, thank you for the great introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Again, AI Mastery, Elevating Outcomes Through Data Quality and Governance. Um, with me today, I have three wonderful panelists that we're excited to introduce. If you can go to the next slide, Sashin. Um, as you're advancing the slide, I'm going to start introducing Anne Maria Bevelisu. Uh, Senior Director, AI Lab Precisely. Um, Anna Maria has been working in the software industry for over 20 years. She started in various technical and leadership roles and then moved on to working with emerging technologies and their potential use at Precisely. Currently, Anna Maria leads the Precisely AI Lab, which is a team of data scientists focused on identifying customer challenges that are good candidates to solve using artificial intelligence and turn them into product features. Welcome, Anna Maria. Thanks, great to be here. Thank you. Next, Sashin Bepit, VP of Value Engineering and Business Architecture with Precisely. Sashin brings 30 plus years of professional experience leveraging technology to deliver business outcomes. In the last 20 years, he's been focused on helping companies articulate and realize the value from their investments in enterprise software solutions. He has helped several Fortune 500 business leaders make technology investments aligned with their strategic priorities. His latest focus is to help leaders of data and analytics harness the promise of AI to increase innovation and efficiency while delivering tangible business value. Welcome, Sachin. And finally, Thank we you. have yeah, great, thanks. And finally, we have Matt Vandeveer, VP of Strategic Services at Precisely. And with over 29 years of experience, the last 14 focused on data governance, Matt is known as an expert in data governance, enterprise architecture, technology implementations, and software development. His business process knowledge extends to several key industries, and his background in SAP, client server, and web applications gives him a deep understanding of technical considerations that he leverages as he works with clients on optimizing their processes and implementing technology. So welcome, Matt. Welcome, thank you. All right, um, we can move on. Um, so we're really excited to have um, our three panelists. And as we get started, Sachin is gonna give us a little bit of a, a background that we can be grounded in before we get going with our panel. So Sachin. Thank you very much. Sound check, can you hear me okay? Yep. Sounds okay, good. perfect. Thank you very much, Julie and Shannon, uh, for the intros, and truly delighted and excited to be here. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about Precisely a little bit. Who is Precisely and what? how do we help uh, companies get better through better decisions? Better data means better decisions, and that's how we empower organizations all over the world, including 99 of the Fortune 100 companies, to build trust in data. We believe that in order to 
for the data to be trustworthy, it needs to be accurate, consistent, and contextual. We have a term for it. We call it data integrity. And we have decades of deep domain experience delivering data integrity to companies. And we have a very unique combination of software, data, and data strategy services that we work with clients across the journey to the data integrity. Organizations from different industries are partnering us specifically to understand what data integrity means in the age of AI and how to achieve it. So before we go any further, let's talk about what the impact of AI is on the overall economy. Which industries will it impact most and which lines of businesses will adopt it and are adopting it already? And what, what are some of the challenges associated with data integrity? So McKinsey in a recent study estimated the impact of Gen AI specifically, the step change in the AI evolution to be somewhere between 6.1 to $7.9 trillion annually. And this big impact will be focused on all the industries, but some are going to use AI and going to adopt it sooner than the others and make the progress sooner than others. And these are healthcare, finance, retail, manufacturing, telco, and industries like this. It's important to also understand that AI will help these companies through very different, very valuable use cases. Just to name a few examples, in healthcare, it will help us deliver outcomes that are very focused on the patient and deliver services and advice and also treatments that are tailored to the patient. In finance, it will be helping, it is already helping, do algorithmic trading and risk reduction. We all are Amazon customers, I assume, and we know how it helps in sales and marketing and e-commerce. The key areas of business, lines of business that will continue to see a higher adoption of AI are R&D, research and development, sales and marketing, order fulfillment, customer service, as well as customer operations. Let me give you two simple examples. Moderna, the pharmaceutical company, the CEO, Stefan Bounsel, recently said that with help of AI, scientists will likely understand more diseases in the next three to five level at the very basic biological level, which will be the first for humans on this planet. It will also help us treat diseases like Alzheimer and cancer like never before. Let me change the scene. I live in Atlanta and Georgia, and there has been huge investment from Tyler Perry here in film studios. Last four years, he was working on a multi-million, 800 million actually, dollar expansion, 12 stage studios and 330 acre investment in expanding these studios. He saw an AI uh, demo, which was generating videos from text to AI. After seeing that, he stopped that investment and said, I need to better understand what this technology can do for me before I make this big decision. So it is really, the AI is here, it is here to stay, and it is growing incredibly fast. Now, chances are your organization already uses AI. If any of these use cases seem familiar to you, you already are using AI. That's 91% of businesses that have ongoing investments in AI. People are using chatbots, people are using it for knowledge management, for customer service, order fulfillment, and so on. However, when asked about, is your data ready for AI? Only 4%, only 4% of organizations answer in affirmative. And that too is a self-reported matrix, so it may be a little bit questionable. This was done, this uh, survey was done by Gartner at an IT symposium. So what happens when your data is not AI ready? There is bias and hallucination. There are inaccurate predictions. There's excessive time spent on data prep and 
that can be used and should be used for model tuning and generating valuable insights for the business. So in short, to elevate business outcomes through AI, it is imperative to get data quality and data governance right. With that, Julie, I'll hand it back to you for panel discussion. Thank you so much for setting the stage for our discussion today. I'm so excited to have the three of you with us because I think we're gonna have a lot of good various perspectives. So um, with that, we're gonna jump right into our first question for the panel. Um, and that question is, how does the integrity of data directly influence the trustworthiness and reliability of AI systems in practical applications? I'd like to go first. I can go first. Um, the topic of, <clears throat> excuse me, topic of artificial intelligence and organizations potential use of the technology kind of has executives scrambling to ensure that they're positioned to leverage capability. Some of what Sashin was saying earlier about is the data ready? And AI models are the ultimate garbage in, garbage out technology. AI can only produce an answer as good as the data it can consume in order to render a result. Therefore, because of the potential risk involved um, in acting on a flawed AI result, organizations need a robust data management program to ensure that the data being leveraged by the AI models is as good as it can be. First goal there is to obtain all the data the AI model will use to provide a useful result. You have to capture where the data has come from. What does it mean from a business perspective and what if any transformations have been executed on that data? This all has to be documented and able to be proven. You know, when you start to think about it, these are the base components of any solid data catalog, data lineage program, and become really, you know, table stakes to start using AI to render results rather than just a mere accelerator. I'd also like to jump in. Yeah, just to add on top of what uh, Matt was saying, and such in earlier, AI models are an abstraction of the data that they're trained on, right? So issues in the training data will eventually manifest in the model that they uh, that they train. If you want to have trustworthy and reliable AI systems, it's critical to have trust in the data that you use to train them. It's it's as simple as that. And uh, Sachin was mentioning, uh, how do you get trust in data? Data integrity, what we call accuracy, consistency, and context. These are the three pillars that we defined and I'll go a bit over all of them. So accuracy, we talked at length, garbage in, garbage out, direct impact on the output of AI models. Uh, and I'll just give an example. If you train a model to determine market audience for a campaign and you train with an accurate demographics data, because there's some issues in the pipeline that you don't know of, the model will learn to market to the wrong people. Maybe you're gonna get the different age segment to send your marketing uh, material to, which is all wrong. Consistency means that the data is reliable. It's up to date across all systems in the organization and has uniform usage. An example here is um, stale data used in uh, AI powered inventory forecasting system can lead to inaccurate demand predictions, which result in overstocking or understocking, which in turn impact operational efficiency and customer satisfaction. And the third one is context. Third-party data complements the data that you have. It enhances the output of an AI system and it makes it more relevant to the business question that it is solving. For example, if you're an insurance company and you're trying to assess the risk exposure of the insured properties, and we see this a lot with a lot of our insurance customers, having context about um, wildfire risk, flood zone risk, uh, a distance to a fire hydrant, the shape of a property, all this extra information for each of the properties, make it for a more accurate risk assessment. So trusted data is critical to build all this trust and having reliable AI systems. All right, thank you. Um, next question, what are the most significant challenges organizations face today in maintaining high data quality for AI? I can go first. Data quality is an interesting topic, but because from a context perspective, it's historically been done in arrears, meaning you have an issue, you go do some root cause analysis to find out what caused the problem, and then you put things in place to make sure that the problem doesn't happen again. You don't have that ability with using AI. You now have to try to do it in advance, which is a little more of a you know, 
trying to figure out if this is going to work or is it not. So the issue with data quality is that you still have that ability to check the result from a human perspective before you're actually acting upon it. You know, that's the, you know, the creative process to unwind a bad result is going to be absolutely necessary until you can conf confirm that your data quality is where you want it. Yes, and, and to add on that, a key data challenge um, for data quality is transitioning from being reactive to having a proactive approach, exactly what Matt was saying. And doing this also at scale because we see growing volumes of data like never before. So AI can help you. Right? AI uh, is not just a beneficiary of high quality data, it's also the contributor and the producer of high quality data. So it goes on both ends. Um, then a couple of examples here are uh, for quality rule recommendations. There's, there are AI systems that can analyze existing data and they, you can identify patterns, you can identify outliers, data relationships, correlations between columns. All this information can be used to suggest new quality rules that can be put in place to prevent data issues from happening in the first place. So do it very at the, at the very beginning of your pipelines before you do anything else. And second is to continuously monitoring the data. There are AI-driven monitoring solutions that continuously track data quality metrics and provide real-time feedback on the data health, again, before any, any data health issues impact the downstream uh, AI applications. Over time, businesses and functions have grown often without a data strategy. Like Matt was saying, it's data quality is done in arrears. Um, and oftentimes also data strategy is often either an afterthought in the best case, but mostly not even a thought. So for this world of AI that we are living in and increasingly becoming deep in, having a data strategy and understanding which parts of the data are critical to the data models or the AI data models in any given industry is critical to the success of implementing AI and harnessing value from it for any company in insurance, banking, telco, and all other industries. Different functions rely on different quality tools and many times varying data sources are leveraged for getting same type of data. So let me give you an example, location data that is so critical to insurance, to telco, to financial services is oftentimes in large organizations sourced from many, many different sources and the quality varies highly and so does its integrity. And that severely impacts the decision-making speed and effectiveness. How should an underwriter be certain about a geolocation if their data isn't 100% accurate? How can they take a location, geocode it, and then other functions can refer to that same location using a unique identifier? These things are not resolved or not thought through in many companies just because data has never been a proactive approach. It has been all, always, oh, data is very unclean. We need to do something because we can't function like this anymore situation. So putting Gen AI on top of bad data will lead to bad outcomes as one of the participants rightly pointed out in the chat. So it's imperative that in this world of Gen AI especially and AI broadly, data strategy should be in the, at the forefront of executives' minds and in the execution plan of company strategy. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate all those great responses. Um, let's, let's talk about the evolving state of data governance. So as AI technologies advance, how should data governance practices evolve to ensure ethical use, privacy, and compliance? So I can take this one. Uh, first of all, I would like to second what Sachin said. Data governance has to be considered in the bigger picture of a data strategy. A data strategy is a prerequisite to having a solid data strategy as a foundation and uh, a prerequisite for having su successful AI systems. Not only that, but data governance have to be thought of as being embedded in the entire development lifecycle of AI systems from day one. It cannot be an afterthought. 
So going to your question about privacy compliance and uh, ethical use, I'll start with data privacy. Uh, you have to have solution that do automatic dictation of PII items, personally identifiable information, and you have to put a, a set of measures in place that protect it, either through strict access control policies or by masking the PII data. For compliance, there's at least a couple of points that we need to talk about. There's the data confidentiality and data usage review, which involves bringing your legal teams. There has to be a review of contractual agreements that specify how the data can be shared and how the data can be used. And not only that, but with Gen AI, there's an additional challenge. There's an additional challenge of having legal review to assess if the output of a large language model raises any intellectual property or copyright concerns. It's not just your usual typical AI system that we call traditional AI or ML. Uh, also on compliance, you need to consider security risk assessment. So you have to get your IT, your technical infrastructure team, get their point of view. Again, be proactive to identify and mitigate any uh, potential security gaps so you don't have any data leakage and compromise any data. And the last piece that you asked about, Julie, was the ethical AI. And this is a very complex topic. We can do a whole webinar just on this one. It's a multidisciplinary effort. And it includes experts from ethics, from law, sociology, policy, even philosophy. And it's also an evolving field. And as you might have heard, there's also evolving legislation as well. But Europe just passed something. There's a lot of discussion here in the US on that as well. So to start somewhere, first, you need to put in place an AI ethics strategy. You have to define what are your core values in the organizations? What are the guiding principles that you want to follow? Explainability, transparency, and so on. And then you have to have a governance system that keeps an audit trail and includes not only the governance of the data, but also the governance of the AI models. You have to start documenting decisions, document data gathering, data curation, all the model iterations, all the trainings that are happening. So all this have to come together and it's all part of having this transparency and complete audit trail. And uh, one more point on, on ethics. Um, it's not just an engineering and data science team activity. It has to be company-wide. There has to be education that comes with it, from HR to marketing to product management. Essentially, all functional teams in organizations need to be aware. When using AI system, there's always a component of ethics AI, which comes with the data and all the things that I mentioned. Yeah, I mean, let me jump in on that. It's like, from a practical perspective, establishing your data catalog along with the classification to that catalog is critical. Understanding what data you're getting from a lineage perspective and similar to the art world with provenance of art, you know, where, where is it coming from? How, is it, how are the handoffs being managed? How is the transformations being understood? All of that is critical to understand that you are treating the data ethically and that you're actually presenting to the AI model a data set that is fit for purpose. Great responses. Um, so let's talk a little bit about bias and AI. Um, in, in what ways can data quality initiatives help mitigate biases in AI algorithms? And what role does data governance play in this process? So before we dive into how to fix it, let's talk about why fix it and how big of an impact bias in AI can have if we don't get it right. Let me start with healthcare. Underrepresented data of women and minority groups can skew the predictive AI algorithms. It can give the wrong predictions and suggest the wrong things to do to those that are doing computer-aided diagnosis. Actually, computer-aided diagnosis CAD systems have been found to return lower accuracy results for Black patients than white patients. So being aware and fixing this ahead of time is critical to using these systems for treatment. Another example is from HR. Application tracking systems are used widely in recruiting and hiring. Amazon, for example, stopped using a hiring algorithm after it found out that it favored applicants based on words like executed or captured, which were more, like, more commonly found on men's resumes. Online advertising, 
Biases in search engine ad algorithms can reinforce job role gender bias. An independent study done by Carnegie Mellon University uh, revealed that Google's online advertising system displayed higher paying positions to males more often than women. So all these kinds of impacts can be expected if you don't get uh, data right through all different biases. In product development, for example, uh, designing of seat belts and these systems and headrests and airbags and cars develop prominent, predominantly using male-centric data results in or resulted in higher level of injuries for women uh, passengers. In public sector, for example, there is reinforcement of stereotypes. Biased facial recognition systems may disproportionately misidentify individuals from certain racial backgrounds and potentially lead to unjust consequences, such as wrongful arrests or denial of services. So bias is a very critical topic in AI, and I'll let Anna Maria and Matt talk about how to get a handle on it. Right, and so to minimize bias, you need to ensure a balanced, diverse, and representative training data set. Essentially, you want to ensure that the data set you're using accurately reflect the real world scenario that you're trying to solve. So on the data quality side, one way to do it is to use a profiling tool. You want to gain, gain insight into the data sets. You want to understand the data ranges, anomalies, correlations, data distributions, statistical information, and then all this information can be applied into selecting the appropriate elements from the data set that can be used to develop the AI system. For instance, if you're training a fraud detection system and use a data set where only a small percentage of cases are fraudulent, which is the most likely the case, the system may be biased to predict that most cases are not fraud. But when you profile the data, you can identify imbalances in the data and then subsequently you can use only a subset of the data to have a more balanced representation of fraud and non-fraud cases in the training data set. On the governance side, I think it's very important to make the data discoverable so that it can be found and including in your training data sets. And this can be done if you have a powerful search feature and search capabilities on part of the data governance tool, but the search is only as good as the metadata that you search through. So if your meta metadata has um, cryptic names, the search is not going to find much. There's no way anybody can solve that. So it's very important to curate your metadata, use descriptive names, describe your assets, refine your business terms, define ontologies, apply data relationship into the governance system that you're using. The more you do this, the more discoverable your data becomes. And of course, this comes with a challenge at doing it at a scale because currently it's a very manual intensive process but there will be more AI assisted features to, to increase efficiency here. And uh, another aspect I wanted to mention, it's not just about training data. It's also about, um, it's also very important to monitor new data with data observability solutions. It's important to continuously track data quality metrics. And at, at, if you get the failure signal in data health, trigger, have a trigger signal, which retrain the model that are based on it. For instance, if you have an AI model that classifies products, but now you have a new product showing up in one of your new records, the model doesn't know anything about the new product and it may give you an incorrect output or just misclassify it. So to solve this, you monitor for data drift, you see the new value, you get the system, and then you retrain and start all over again. You know, to add on what Anna said, it's a, you know, data initiatives that have an eye toward integrating all data in context, you know, third-party data, not just the data you create and maintain, it's data you're able to consume from the outside world. Most bias issues are generally due to data you do not have. So the key is to make sure, and this is where the governance organization comes into play is ensuring that you are taking a holistic view of all the data issues you may have. Thank you so much. So, so let's look at making this a little bit more real. Um, can you provide any examples where high quality 
data and strict data governance have led to significant improvements or breakthroughs in AI applications? Sure, happy to. So uh, let me take a few examples of how precisely has helped clients uh, get data, high data quality and govern the data to get better business outcomes. So first example is that from a precisely customer that is a big company in mortgage financing and information. Uh, they buy mortgages on the secondary market, pull them and sell them as mortgage-backed securities to ensure liquidity in the housing market. They also work with uh, low-income uh, demographics to provide mortgages. They had data challenges. They needed data that was clean and well-governed, better understood to, feel the, feel, to feed their ML models. Uh, they wanted to be able to verify the accuracy of the data and the consistency of the data. What they did is they sought Precisely's help to standardize and verify the property addresses with our data quality solutions. Started geocoding the addresses and also creating a persistent ID for each lat long position so they can refer back to that position through any application and also use that as a unique identifier to addressing data and enrichment uh, questions with third party data sets, et cetera. So their impact was pretty incredible. They ad added uh, another $7 billion worth of revenue customers because they understood better the demographics and they better understood the geographies they were marketing to and were able to increase 34% the increase in availability of their customers. Second example is from a communications company. They were able to identify and generate 10% additional revenue by identifying additional customers in the geographies that they were going to market in. How they did that was they were, again, able to pinpoint by going into the data, depth of the data, they were able to pinpoint, ah, in this area, we have multi-dwelling units. So it's only one address, but there are 50 or even 500 residents around this address. This simple, if you will, uh, fact wasn't obvious to them among the millions of records that they deal with. And it's very hard to get it right, even basic things like that. So that's the point about uh, sourcing data and single sourcing it from the right sources and having high integrity. And that led to expanding their business and providing more services under the Connect America Fund build out that they were working with. The third example is around reducing the time to curate data sets and reducing the time to build trusted data. So with the right governance and the quality strategy, one of the large national financial services company in the mortgage business was able to reduce their time to prep data for AI models from 13 hours to 3.2 hours. So doing data governance and data quality right can have significant impact on businesses and their efficacy. I think a more practical application of all the things that Shun was saying is, and we've seen it all the time in data is single view of the customer. You know, doing that governance construct correctly allows groups to take advantage of all the cross-sell, upsell, capabilities that AI has to offer, but it still comes with some fun foundation or fundamental work that you have to do to be able to take advantage of it. Thanks, Pat. Um, let's throw a little bit more into the data quality piece. So apart from accuracy that we've talked about, what other aspects of data quality should organizations focus on um, in order to improve their AI outcomes? So we talked about uh, accuracy, but we also talked about context and completeness, which is critical. And they both, they all go hand in hand. So for example, in the insurance industry, it's critical, like Ana Maria was saying earlier, to have not only the information about the location, but then enrich it with the cat risk information around flood and wildfire and others. But if you don't have the geolocation correct, your enrichment, could lead to actually wrong decisions. If your structure that you're insuring 
is over 100 feet away from where the actual or where you think the structure is, is over 100 feet away from where the actual structure is, you could be in a different flood zone or a different wildfire risk zone. And that those are the kinds of things that can uh, mess up essentially the outcomes from AI models and the responses for AI models. And just to add a few more things, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, just three things come to mind. Data freshness and data relevancy. You need to ensure that the data is kept fresh, data is up to date. If you have very accurate data on house prices from 10 years ago, it's not gonna help you in any way to do any price analysis today. It's not. It's just not relevant anymore. Um, data completeness is another one. You want um, accurate information, let's say, on all the products that you have in the in your inventory. If it's partially, if it's accurate only on part of the products, and you have gaps in the coverage, your analysis is not going to be as good. And the third one is for data consistency. Um, think about normalizing the data that you're using. Normalize to the same schema. Normalize to the same a uh, unit of measure. Uh, for instance, if you do a lot of M&A or if you have customers in two different organizations in your company, you have the same information represented in different tables and different schemas. You want to unify it to the common denominator and present it to the rest of your downstream systems in a consistent way. So yes, accuracy is critical, but to get even better results, you have to consider other dimensions of data quality. Thank you. So if we look ahead, um, what are some key trends or innovations in data governance that organizations should prepare for or stay ahead in the AI domain? Depending on the industry, AI will accelerate and optimize the execution of strategy. We are already seeing that. It will also create new business models and allow companies to innovate pretty drastically on their business models. Like we saw in the Tyler Perry example earlier, you don't need real estate anymore. If all the work that you did to analyze real estate, buy it, manage it, all that goes away. Completely new business model for somebody in that business. So it will really drastically change everything. And the key for businesses to succeed and achieve the outcomes they're looking for is to first work with uh, the available use cases and select those that are applicable to their business model. Ideal is to work with some high impact and quick to achieve use cases for the organization to learn on hand these use cases and become confident in using AI. And at the same time, creating a multi-year roadmap for introducing AI in the organization and building an AI enabled strategy. Key is here also to understand that Oftentimes, just like we were saying, data strategy is an afterthought, if at all, data literacy is not a thing that companies focus on at all. And now that AI is becoming democratized and so commonly available and so readily available to the corporate citizens, it will be critical to have data enablement for employees and for you know, all different ranks. And all this is, of course, going to work if there is high level of data quality in the organization being made available to AI models. So I can add to that a different perspective also looking ahead at data governance. I think we need to be aware that having data versus having data sets versus having knowledge in the data are different things. For instance, you can have a customer table and a product table and if they have cryptic names and they're just sitting in a in a data lake somewhere, it's just raw data, no no use to anybody. Now you come and put meaningful names and descriptions on those tables. You curate, you put quality around them. Now they become data sets. They're starting to get ready to use. But you can do even more than that. Now you can add relationships, how they relate to each other. A customer buys products. So now you're adding knowledge, you give meaning. So now the downstream usage and consumers, which to such a point become not just your data engineers and data scientists, is to the business users, they can use it and make sense of it and understand it and leverage it. So metadata curation, I go back to it. Metadata curation will be critical in turning raw information into knowledge 
and it's critical in data discovery so that organizations really tap into all the data that they have and use it to feed into the AI systems. And again, automation and governance solution is needed so this can be done at scale. I'll talk about it before. So I think we're going to see increased uh, AI techniques and governance solution to, to do this. From a you know practitioner perspective, I think from a you know, data governance organization point of view, they're going to need to start to shift from dedicated solely on what we would say critical data elements, which generally goes around 20 to 25% of all the data they curate, to actually certifying complete data sets that are fit for purpose and defining clearly what those purposes, those data sets are certified for. Data lineage, understanding transformations through the landscape and what data quality enrichment measures that have been put in place that proves that the data set is fit for purpose is pretty much gonna be table stakes for AI. If you're not doing some of that stuff, you need to before you take on that risk of leveraging an AI model. All right. So as we start to wrap up and move on to our Q&A, um, do you, each of you have any final thoughts on how data quality and data governance can help improve that mastery of AI? Sure, I, I get to start. So as Sachin mentioned, with the latest developments in the AI space, we find that AI becomes more accessible to teams beyond data engineers and data scientists, right? We talked about it before. And therefore, it's more important than ever to have a solid data strategy. And data quality and data governance are key pieces of that. That's number one. And number two is you have to strongly consider putting this in your projects from day one so that you can set a solid foundation to support any successful AI systems. Absolutely. And key to harnessing the potential of AI is really understanding the value they will deliver to your business model and creating a roadmap for value realization. And then it is all about execution. It's about enabling the organization with data literacy and with the right tools around governance and data quality. Well, thank you guys. This has been a really a great discussion. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you do have questions, please use that Q&A panel and go ahead and submit them. We're going to go ahead and move on to our Q&A and um, start answering some of the questions that have come in so far. But please go ahead if you have others, put them in that panel right now. Um, so our first question um, asked about the slide that um, Sachin had uh, presented about the 91% of leading businesses investing in AI. And that I believe um, was a statistic from New Vantage. Um, so that was that was where that came from, and you can see that on the slides when you when you get that. Um, the next question was: I would love to hear more about how you report the progress and results of this work. The C-suite nods at it, but it'd be wonderful to see a metric for the board. Does anyone have any comments on that question? Yeah, I, I can take this one. So um, I would. Turn it a little bit around and I would say before you embark on any AI project, start with step one. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? What is the value that you're trying to add to your business? And as you do that and you start writing it down, one of the things you're going to write is how are you going to measure the impact? So you define it yourself at the beginning of the project. This is not something that you do afterwards. So assume the project will be successful. What would you expect to see? What, what are the impacts that you are looking for? Um, I can give a couple of examples. Let's say you are in R&D, you're looking to use Gen AI, the co-pilot, to accelerate R&D um, uh, develop efficiencies, right? Writing documentation, unit tests, even code, depending on what you're doing. So let's say you deploy it, let's say it's successful. How do you define success? Do you quantify with metrics? Are they quantitative, qualitative? Do you measure the morale boost to your engineers and you say, give me, does this make you happier? Rate on one to five, the impact it has on your work. That's how you get the qualitative aspects. On the quantitative, you can say, what's my uh, time to merge? What's my time to write unit tests? What's my time to uh, write documentation? So you define the business problem that you're solving and you define the criteria for success to solve that business problem. And then once you have it, of course, you can report on it at the end. But this is something you have to do in the very beginning. 
great points. What I would like to add to what Anna Maria just said is, I think the journey should also, that's kind of what in my words is, the journey should start with a solid business case for AI in the organization. And it should be supporting a multi-year roadmap for introducing AI driven use cases in the organization. And with each use case, there should be, what are the expected benefits of this use case? What is the cost of this use case? And then a tracker to Ana Maria's point around how are we doing against our goals? How are we achieving the business outcomes we expected? Are we improving the key performance indicators, the KPIs that we expected to improve? It can go down to the level of process performance indicators and go below that so you understand at a granular level. Now, the question is, how do you report it back to the C level? Of course, you don't want to go into the PPI type level to the C level, but you can give them an idea of here are the investments, here is the expected ROI, and this is how we are doing against those goals as the time progresses. Thank you. I think also for the C suite, you know, it's important that you know, they want to stay out of jail. So you don't want to take any unnecessary risks or they need to know that the groups have put in a safety net underneath them, meaning there's a process to unwind, potentially unwind a bad result or catch it before it is acted upon. You know, those things that definitely will keep executives up at night are the ones that potentially could get them in really hot water with authorities. Thank you. Um, our next question is, um, is AI technology going to be capable of trimming the time down on adding business definitions for technical data, or is that always going to be solely a human-driven effort? I'll take that. So I think the answer is yes, we are going to see improvements in data governance in terms of assistance and recommending the recommender systems to assist with those activities. I don't think we're going to see a replacement, but certainly we will see an augmentation for accelerating those. Uh, for the business definitions, I think everybody's thinking Gen AI here and large language models. You give your tables and columns and you ask for descriptions. I think this have already, we see all, already these features being started to be integrated in data governance products. And we're doing that, that precisely as well. And it's going to also go beyond that. It's going to go uh, to define definitions and descriptions for other assets that you have in your data that you're governing in your system, as well as um, recommending relationships and recommending that knowledge that I was talking about, because there's a semantics associated with that. There's a natural language component to it. And so with the emergence of, not emergence, but uh, the popularity of Gen AI that came, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think it, it's looking promising. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities for to accelerate that process and reduce the amount of time consuming labor because as the question stated, it is a very manual, painful, time consuming effort. Anytime you know my group is doing data governance or program implementations, that is the biggest task and it runs you know, ad infinitum. So anything that will accelerate, even if it's, you know, 50% or 80% of the total is a mass accelerator for the organization and recognizing that value. Adam, that just came in. Do you feel that a danger of AI is that it will recommend or demand more action than a team can feasibly act on? Will there be a demand to boil the ocean? So, there is the risk, and we see this with all the AI systems that we put in place. If you re recommend too many things, or if you raise too many signals on data health, you can get so noisy that you cannot distinguish what's relevant from what's un unrelevant. It's just too many things. You're not going to be able to uh, to review them all, and then even the good ones are going to get lost. And we've seen that in some of the solutions that we've done imprecisely. Then the key here is to go and tune either in the tool, the tool should, should already come pre-tuned or there should be a, a configuration options where you can go and tune to the level of alerts 
or to the level of recommendations that you want to see. So you reach that balance. And it's very hard to generalize this. It's very specific to the data that you have, to the use, to the use case that you have. But there is a, a point where you can find that nice sweet point uh, balance between how much noise you get versus how many useful information you're getting. So if the solution is done in a in a in a good way, it will provide an acceleration rather than oh now it's this other thing that I have to deal with on top of what I already had. Absolutely. And I think it will also take work off people's hands in a very, very big way. So uh, one of the big impact on the economy that I was talking about right in the beginning, one part is of course new gen AI driven use cases, but the other part is increase in worker productivity, increase through better knowledge management, but also through automated creation of content. So I don't think that necessarily AI will put more pressure on people to do more. On the contrary, I think it will alleviate a lot of mundane tasks and the burden of those tasks and will do a lot of things for them that they had to painstakingly do today. So it's not only going to alleviate the, uh, that's, it's the, the burden of unpleasant tasks and such, it will incredibly increase the productivity, but also perhaps make work more fun. So I, for one, is I'm really looking forward to how it impacts our daily lives, our work lives, and how it makes work more fun for all of us. All right, great. Um, what additional training or development do you recommend for data governance professionals to increase knowledge on AI governance and AI data quality? I can uh, take that one. I think it's more around getting groups a, a larger scope of vision as to what data is around them and how it's used. You know, it's, I mentioned this earlier, it's very easy to just deal with the data you create and maintain. And it's a lot of the AI models can very take advantage of the greater data elements or data sets that is created in the world around them. So it's basically taking, you know, taking a step up rather than looking down at themselves. Um, can you please give an end-to-end -end high level view on how data quality can be operationalized for training data? Matt, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. That's because I'm still thinking. Oh, okay. I thought it looked like you were talking. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if I, in the six minutes we have, I can come up with a yeah one, but I, I will take that away and whoever answered it, I will make sure I get them an answer. That looks like I was an anonymous attendee. Um, all right, we will jump to the next one. Um, are tools mature enough to track AI ethics models that were noted earlier, i.e. audit trail of data and use of AI models? I can try to answer that. And the answer is, uh, to some extent, they are, but there's some way to go. And what I mean by that is that we do have certain capabilities in place where you can have lineage, like we talked about. We can track the access control. You can uh, document a lot of the activities that are happening. You can define your um, operations and the flows and the approval processes. In, that, in governance tools. I'm sure, Matt, you have more examples. So that part more on the, how do you operationalize it? Is some of, some of the things are there. However, the ethics is still a, an evolving field. It's very, um, it's fairly, it's very much under development. Um, IBM and uh, Microsoft, they even have an assessment framework that they're putting together with a lot of experts in their own companies based on customers' feedback and discussions that they're having. So I think that we do have some of it, but I think there's more, more to come. I don't know, Sachin and Matt, if you have other thoughts on this. We, we probably need to move on because of the time, but thank okay. you, I appreciate that. 
uh, response. So I'm going to go ahead and um, close out the Q&A. Thank you, everybody, for submitting um, your questions. We appreciate the time you took to put those in. So just a few takeaways. What did we talk about today? Um, so we talked about data integrity being critical um, in the success of AI. Um, we talked about some key principles of data quality for trust in AI. We talked about some crucial considerations of data governance enabling effective AI and the transformative impact of governed quality data on AI. Here are some, we talked a little bit, Sashin talked a little bit earlier about uh, some of the information about Precisely, if you're not familiar with us, here are some of the clients we serve across industries. Um, and so you could take a look at that. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can check out our ebook to uncover more about the foundational elements of trusted AI, uh, the top challenges to trusted AI, how to overcome them and more. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon to close out the webinar. Thank you Julie. for your uh, Julie, thank you so much. And thanks to our esteemed panel. It's been a great discussion and so fun to have a panel format for this webinar. Um, and again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you so much to our attendees for being so great and so engaged in everything we do and hope to see you all again in the next webinar. Thanks, you all. I appreciate it. Thanks to Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.